This book is called The Road to Sleeping Dragon because it ends in Wolong. It ends in Sleeping Dragon, right? The Panda Preserve. And I reached a point that many, many of us do in this room, which is something T.S. Eliot wrote in a poem, which was um, in the middle of a poem, all of a sudden he stops and he says, we had the experience but missed the meaning. And I started reflecting a lot, especially now that I'm at an American university, about, well, I have all this quote-unquote knowledge of China. I have all these experiences in China. So what? What does this add up to? And previously, my, my first two books and before that, all of my writing was journalistic. And in journalism, you have to be the expert. You know, you pump you your feathers out and you sort of say, I know what I'm talking about. Everybody should listen to me. I have knowledge to impart to you. And I'm finding now, because I'm in the humanities, I'm not in the, the China um, specialty field, right? I'm in the humanities and I'm teaching students creative writing, nonfiction writing, that they're very overwhelmed and sort of, when I start talking about China, it sort of washes over them, right? They don't care about the minutia as much as journalists and political scientists and experts do. They want to know the story. Again, what's the meaning? And you think the arc of most, most novels and not great nonfiction books, especially memoir, is a story of change, of learning, from Huck Finn all the way to Cheryl Strait, you know, hiking the Pacific Crest Trail and wild. And so I started thinking about, when I go back to my getting to China, learning this country, you know, I was scared, I was unsure, I felt foolish, I was often embarrassed, I was incredibly vulnerable. And it was difficult to write about that, but I wanted to show that arc that people have to go through, I think, when they engage with the culture, especially one as different as China. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. But the end of this book, again, is toward, you know, after my first 10 years in China, when I felt like I had my footing under me, um, I wanted to start being more active, not just be a fly on the wall, start you know, uh, participating in civil society. And I got involved with uh, UNESCO, training heritage site managers. So the head of the Patala Palace, Suzhou Gardens, and they would come and we would have conferences in places like Lushan, you know, in Jiangxi. And I would show them pictures of American national parks, of American <coughs> museums, of American plaques at places. And I would talk about preserving a sense of place. And from that I got involved with Wolong, which at the time was trying to redevelop the valley into a theme park. And they wanted to build a panda coaster, they actually called it that, and an IMAX theater. I mean, so I got you know, the National Geographic Society involved and Yosemite involved. And there was a, at the end of this book, there's a lobbying effort that, that goes on. And as Jan, or many of you can speak much better than I can about this, you know what that feeling is when you're at the table and you feel you can really affect change and you have to put all that knowledge into practice. So the book is that arc leading to that. Now, I do want to begin, though, just by reading a page from the book, just to set up for you how I got to China and what I was doing there. Many of you probably know the writer Li Yutang, who wrote My Country and People. Okay, he's who I'm quoting here. I'm an unlikely answer to the question asked anxiously by a Chinese writer in 1935, who will be China's interpreters? Sixty years later, I arrived by accident after rejecting six other countries from the Peace Corps. I was fluent in Spanish and applied after a short stint volunteering at the Texas-Mexico border with the United Farm Workers, hoping to be sent to Latin America. The Peace Corps offered Turkmenistan, Vladivostok, Sri Lanka, and Kiribati. It's not Club Med, it's the Peace Corps, the recruiter finally snapped. <laughs> after I declined to spend two years in Mongolia or Malawi, you don't get to choose. Months passed until one late spring day, the phone rang in the English classroom in Madison, Wisconsin, where I was student teaching. I heard the voice of the all but forgotten recruiter who pronounced a single word with great finality, China. It sounded like a sentence, although really it was a reprieve. I didn't know Peace Corps was in China, I said, twirling the phone cord, stalling for time. In fact, the program had just tenuously begun after its planned 1989 start was shelved following the crackdown around Tiananmen Square. I was 17 then, and when I heard of the bloodshed via my Beatles radio, I pulled to the road's shoulder and, completely out of character, burst into tears. I didn't know any Chinese people personally. I had never read a book by a Chinese writer. I could not have found Beijing on a map. But suddenly a world event had punctured my bubble of enormous teenage self-regard. Six years later, I knew little about the country beyond the Great Wall, pandas, one billion people, fortune cookies, and the indelible image of a man standing in front of a tank. In 1995, China was more of a pariah than a hot travel destination, academic subject, or journalist beat. The country's ascent looked far from guaranteed. What looked preordained was its demise. 
One third of China's population lived in poverty. The average Chinese worker earned only $500 each year. That number now is $8,000 a year. It's gone up that much in 20 years. Permitting the Peace Corps to send English teachers coincided with China opening its doors to the wider world and its markets. Still, there were limits. When Chairman Mao held power, Chinese propagandists, not wrongly, had condemned the Peace Corps as a tool of American imperialism. Rather than change its verdict, the current regime simply changed the program. Officially, the recruiter said, you'll be called a US-China friendship volunteer. He paused, and through the phone line, I heard the rustle of papers. I don't know how to say it in Chinese. I couldn't speak the language either, of course. I didn't even know how it sounded. Not only was I wrong about fortune cookies, they're from California by way of Japan, I couldn't even use chopsticks. But this was it, Peace Corps' take it or leave it, final offer, China. Last paragraph. Six weeks later, I handed the grim border agent the tissue-thin form that asked arriving passengers if they had mental confusion or psychosis, manic, paranoid, or hallucinatory. A connecting flight landed in China's southwest, where I would be posted as an English instructor at a teacher training institute located on a dead-end dirt road at the bend of a polluted river whose name, Tuo, sounded like the spitting that scored Sichuan streets. The province was 1,000 miles from Beijing, but really a world away in terms of development and engagement with the West. Speaking of, I'm flattered for the young uh, actor of it, yeah. Um, you know, the first thing that happens when you get to China, when you're there for the first time, if you're a foreigner, is you get rechristened. Uh, my name, Meyer, in Chinese is Mai R, right? Mai, to sell, and R, R, it's a son. And in Sichuan slang, Mai R is a son sold in the marketplace by his parents. <laughs> and so my Chinese teacher said, well, that will not do. And he gave me the name Mei Ying Dong, which means, I guess you would say heroic Eastern plum blossom, right, Mei? And, and I remember, like, every Chinese person laughs, by the way, when they hear my name. And oftentimes people will say, well, that's a girl's name. Which always makes me feel sorry for that girl <laughs> if she exists. Everybody in China calls me Soul Son. I am my R to my family, to my students, to my colleagues, and everyone I interview. But this was the first lesson in China, right? That there's the bureaucracy and there's the official way of doing things, and then there's the way you actually live your life and go about things. So even though I'm officially Plum Blossom, I don't go by that. I, I no one uses it. It's only on official documents, like my diplomas or, or you know uh, Chinese tests and stuff. Um, now again, remember, I usually do this talk for general audiences, so I'll skip through some of this because you know this, but general audiences in the States, and this book is aimed at someone at an airport, late for her flight, wants to read a good narrative about a place she wants to know more about, and grabs this. That's who I'm aiming for. Uh, most Americans you know, don't know how enormous China is. They don't know that the land area is equal in size to the United States. They don't know that there's 150 languages spoken there. I didn't know this. You know, John DeFrancis famously said, asking somebody, do you speak Chinese, is like asking a European, do you speak Romance? Because there's so many variations of it, right? And you all know the 56 nationalities and so forth. But um, just to center us here on the map, I'm, does this work? Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm out here between Chengdu and Chongqing, right? And so this book, my first book is about Beijing and Da Shilar, the, the old neighborhood around Tiananmen Square. My second book is about a region, all of Dongbei up here, former Manchuria. And this book is really about the entire country, but the big focus is on the West. The areas that when I was a correspondent, or I should, shouldn't say a correspondent, when I was a freelance journalist and stringer in Beijing, I never had an official visa, were harder for journalists to get out and cover. Um, for various reasons, which I'll talk about in a second. But I'm focusing in this book on the borderlands and the West and that, that interior that a lot of people don't get to. This is what it looked like when I got there in 95. We're in Neijiang, in Sichuanhua, you say Leijiang, it means inner river. Um, you know, it was a muddy strip with a wet market and a lot of coal smoke, you know, air pollution was a problem. I actually think in, in many places, especially in the countryside, air quality has improved um, as opposed to as in cities because they, they used so many coal burning uh, stoves back in the day. Um, you know, the other thing, I, I was drawn to me, I, I only had $100 in my pocket when I got there. I was broke. I had no savings. I had no camera. And so when other volunteers had cameras, I found that the things I was attracted to and taking pictures of were the exotic, the different, right? And I, it, it took me a while to realize that I thought this is the People's Park in, in, in Chengdu at the tea house. Oh, a bamboo chair. It's lovely. But to the locals, this was a great um, source of shame. 
we don't have factory made chairs. We have to make our chairs out of bamboo, right? And so immediately too, there was that divide of how I'm perceiving things and what I see as exotic or interesting and how the locals themselves see that. And that's a thread that runs throughout my book. So I'm, I'm much more interested in how Chinese view their own country and their culture and their history than what I can necessarily bring to it. But still, this was the sort of stuff my eye was drawn to, of course, because it was new and it was exotic. And I have to say, I think all of us have our own sort of Rosetta Stone moment of, of our contact with China. And our understanding of China was formed by that place we lived in or worked in and the era in which we were there. And it's very difficult for me, even to this day, to break out of this, because my formative years and my first experience in China was in the countryside in Sichuan around homemade toys, homemade items like this. Now I live in Pittsburgh, where there's a booming um, economy around robotics and biotech, fueled largely by Chinese scientists, um, technicians, computer scientists, students, and so forth, coming over to Pittsburgh and having connections between China and Pittsburgh. And it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that sometimes. You know, I think maybe the previous generation were still in, like, China makes our iPhones. But as you know in this room, and I explain to Western audiences especially, China's gone beyond that manufacturing capacity into much bigger things. Now, when I got to Neijang, it was still pretty moribund. You know, one of the first words I learned in Chinese was luohu, right, backward. Um, which to me, I grew up in rural Minnesota, and so there wasn't a great deal of culture shock for me. There were 15 volunteers in my group, seven left after the first year. I always tell young people, join Peace Corps, because you can just quit if you don't like it. They'll have you on a plane in three days. But the seven that left had been in Beijing, Taiwan, or Hong Kong. And so for them to go to Sichuan, it was like, well, this isn't the China we know. This isn't the real China. Whereas for me, it didn't feel, honestly, that much different than the conditions in which I was raised in Minnesota on a dirt road with well water and so forth. Um, I was there just as this dawn of the capitalist economy was creeping in, you know, the market economy, that our floating bridge there had a toll uh, a sign. And you were assessed the toll based on how many legs your, your produce, or your, you had, or your animals had, which had these legs. So humans had two legs, they were charged a certain fare. Uh, chickens were different sized legs, cows, and so forth. Just the beginning of that market economy. Um, you know, when I got there too, I thought, oh, this is gonna be repressive. All 1.3 billion Chinese people march lockstep, whatever Chairman Mao says. You know, this is my mentality at the time. And instead, you know, I landed at this university, it was a teacher training institute at the time, who really didn't know what to do with me. You know, I was plugged in from afar and dropped in there. And the Waiban, uh, remember he took me out the first week and he said, we have four things we want you to teach while you're here. And I said, okay. He said, the Bible, the Enlightenment, the stock market, and the Beatles. And I said, okay, I can do that. It was actually really smart advice, because Beatles songs are short. You know, they're all like two and a half minutes. You're like, please, please me, that whole album I would teach. Um, the students all love the song, We All Live in the Yellow Summer Rain. I could never convince them that it's a submarine. Like, that makes no sense. It's summer rain, for sure. But the other thing they did, you know, is they looked at me and said, you're tall. And I said, sure, comparatively. And they said, basketball. And I said, yes. They said, great, you're on the team. Um, and I said, whoa, 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 there's got to be a rule that, you know, a foreigner can't be on your team. And they said, well, we checked. Um, there hasn't been any foreigners here before, so no one thought to add that rule. And I love that, you know, that's another early lesson that we go through in China, right? Like, it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is to ask permission, right? That old saw. Michael, what year is this? This is 95 to 97, I'm here. And so this was our halftime, you know, it sounded gong at halftime. And then my team would all smoke. <laughs> and then we go, and we never lost. We were undefeated. And so I joined, I joined the Beatles. Well, I got called for every single foul you could be called for, of course. And I had black eyes and purple toenails and all the old. But, um, and my uniform didn't fit. It was really humiliating. I, was like, I had the XL, but it felt like I was wearing underwear. Um, but, um, I thought I was joining the Peace Corps for one reason. You know, I wanted to go birth babies in the moon glow. And I think, fortunately for those babies, I didn't have to do that in China. Uh, but I had an awful lot of time on my hand. This is the, I don't think it's a, an accident that those early Peace Corps groups have produced quite a bit of, of journalists and writers, because we had a lot of time um, to explore, to learn the language, and to sort of sink in slowly. Um, but again, you know, like my early articles, when I look back on this, were about these sort of silly cultural things. And I write about this in the book. I'm a little embarrassed looking back, but I think it's a natural learning curve that we all go through. When I 
um, went to Beijing after Peace Corps. I was stringing at Time Magazine, and a bureau chief there, some of you may know, Matt Forney, he used to work for the Far Eastern Economic Review. And he said, you know, it's fine that you're doing these sort of cute pieces, but you have to move past them. And he said, listen, Mark, there's no new China stories. There's only new China journalists. And he said, you're going to see in your time here that the stories cycle through. Air pollution, human rights, uh, orphanages were a big deal for a while. Uh, Tibet, Taiwan, the Gaokao, right? That these things are, and he said, writers have to go through those baby steps of, of writing about what interests them. But then the question is, again, you had the experience, how did you miss the meaning? How do you get beyond these sort of betrayals of the country? This is me with my students. They were the first group at our school to pay tuition. This is 95 to 97. They did not test in. This was the beginning of those reforms where you could come, find your own major, go on. And again, it was a good time for me to be there because as confused I, as I was about Sichuan, they were just as confused because they were figuring out how do you find a job? How do you get an apartment? How do you get a phone installed at your house? And so forth. So I was sort of learning alongside them. A lot of times Western audiences ask me like, what tragedies befell them? And I said, you know, maybe they went on to lead lives of quiet desperation, but I don't think they have. I've kept in touch with them in the book. I catch up with some of them. Um, but it's, you know, I, I'm, I think maybe I'm an optimist by nature because I teach little kids and now big kids. Um, but my contact with China has largely been rather positive, actually, as I watched this middle class grow and people go on to positions of leadership and, and in business. Now, when I was there too, you know, you were just starting to see the, the Western culture coming in. Things like KFC opened in Chengdu, Marlboro landed. Um, and then, you know, you start seeing the transition too in things as benign as postage stamps, where you have the, maybe some of you remember these, there was a series of traditional Chinese houses that were issued on stamps. And at the same time, there was a series of brand new expressways. So these expressways were the things knocking down a lot of these old traditional houses. But again, and I think many of you know this, so excuse me if I'm repeating a statistic you know, but at the time, if you had told me, well, you know, in 20 years, China's going to construct more miles of expressway than America has, I would have laughed. Or if you had said, China's going to build a high-speed rail network larger than the rest of the world's combined, I would have said, no way, right? A lot of this development surprised me, even though I was on the ground. And just like young Benjamin in The Graduate was told, plastics, I wish someone had told me, Concrete. Just invest in cement. You're going to be fine. You know? Or high speed rail. Exactly. Anything. Just, you'll be rich. Commodity of any sort. A few pictures here just of a transition to. This is in uh, Chongqing across the river. Those are the boats that docked to go through what was then the Three Gorges. Well, I guess it still is. It's just not as, as low. Um, this is at Ciliense, uh, a monastery, a nunnery, I should say, across the river. And that's what Chongqing looked like in 97. You know, again, the air pollution was pretty lousy. And this is what it looks like now from sort of the same vantage point. Chinese cities always look prettier at night. True. Um, you know, and, and the reason I'm showing you this is I don't want to sound, you know, oftentimes in China, progress looks like destruction to an outsider. Um, and of course, I write about this a lot in my books. but. Oftentimes, this development's a good thing, actually. And so this is what my campus looked like in the mid-90s versus come on, what it became, you know, lawn that you can't walk on, decorative trees and high-rise buildings and so forth. Um, but at the same time, you know, when I lived there, you look out the back window from my, my apartment, and it was rapeseed fields, you know, blooming yellow. And you'd see this sort of housing, which again, to me, was like, oh, that's so romantic and beautiful. Well, none of you have to live in it. Um, this was the reason I went on to go write the Beijing book about living in the hotel. You know, these are mud floors, rats, leaking roofs. So I used to sit, you ever, you ever do the thing where you scrape your chopsticks? That was like the big thing to, to, for hygiene, right? There's no, no sanitation at all, and you'd be kicking rats away from your table as you were eating. So when I went back two years ago, um, this and, and those rapeseed fields have been replaced by this. So this is Neijiang, which is a, at the time was a backwater 500,000 person city, which is now 2 million and burgeoning. Western audiences often gasp at this photo and say, oh, it's so terrible. And I remember telling a, a Beijing official, like, you know, when it comes to urban planning, you don't have to make the same mistakes America has made. And he got really indignant and said, we have every right to make the same mistakes that America has made. And, you know, I think, again, from afar, when I look at this, I go, oh, my gosh, what a disaster. But then when you're on the ground and you see how these apartments are used by families, 
who buy two or three units side by side so mom and dad could live next to them and help take care of the kid, how you build equity through owning property and so forth. A different picture takes shape, right? I think to uh, most Americans, this looks like a, a, a you, you know, dystopia, uh, but on the ground, people were actually quite pleased with these changes. This is what Nijan looks like now. You know, there's a ton of development going on. The floating bridge has been replaced with a real bridge. This is, um, do you guys know the painter John Dachian? Does that sound familiar? Okay, so he was here in New York. John Dachian is famous for his forgeries. In fact, he sold forgeries to the Met and didn't tell them they were forgeries until many years later it came out. Uh, but Nijiang is his hometown. He fled to Taiwan from here. But I think it's cool, they, they sort of adopted him. They have to attract tourism now, right? So they've made a museum for him. But when you walk in the museum, the first thing you see is this big declaration. These are all forgeries. John Dachian was a master forger. They've embraced his forgery as part of his, his very Nijiang, you know, ethos. <clears throat> the other thing I want to show you about Nijiang is, you know, even Pearl Bach back in the 20s was writing about the regeneration of Chinese cities, such as Nanjing, where she was living. And she was talking about UCLA trained urban planners um, and engineers coming to China and saying there's enough work to last for centuries here for us and shaping those cities to look like American cities. And I just mentioned the housing thing and so forth. However, now I'm seeing a new generation of Chinese coming to the States and studying environmental engineering and that sort of urban planning, especially from Berkeley. And even in places like Neijiang, which is in the kind of middle of nowhere, um, the development in the city now has, has also trended toward this. So you see those high-rise apartments, but they rerouted the river underneath. It's a tributary of the Yangtze, so they run the river underneath the city, they took the river in the city and made it into a reservoir, and they planted wetlands all around it, and bike paths. You know, in many ways, this is a more livable city than Beijing now, which is another trend I'm sure some of you know about, that China is now trying to bring the city to the countryside to stop migrants from coming into the city. You know, it's enlarging municipal boundaries, um, but it's also putting more effort into developing uh, livable cities in the interior. You know, I mentioned earlier I had a lot of time on my hands and train travel was very cheap. Um, and so a big part of my education, uh, you know, when I was in the Peace Corps was just to travel and wander and get lost. This book opens with an incident where I was attacked on a bus in the middle of nowhere. And the bus driver ended up killing the man that was attacking me. And it was in one of those moments again where you're like, you know, it's funny, these books have audiences in China now because Chinese audiences are like, that could not have happened in our country. There's no way that could have happened. Uh, but it did, and I a lot of my early education in China was, again, spending time off the beaten path into these areas. And for Western audiences, believe it or not, they're often really surprised to see how beautiful China can be. So, you know, if you've been there, this natural beauty, this is in Yunnan, toward the Himalayas. Um, you know, being out in Tibet, these wide open vistas, this is on a ferry going across the Lhasa River. And then, learning about the diversity of the country. Um, I mentioned I was working with UNESCO towards the end of this book, and I, I think you know this, but China, you know, collects UNESCO World Heritage Sites the way actors go after Oscars, and China is now one behind Italy. It's gaining on Italy, but Italy just got two more sites inscribed to China's one. So Italy has 57, I think, now, and, and China has 56. One thing that changed a lot with Chawa that has made China's UNESCO inscription slow down is UNESCO has said, we want to see more of this um, minority culture that you say you have in your country and are promoting. It can't all be just Han culture. We want to know about borderlands along with Korea, for example, Tibet, Muslim areas, and places like Dali, which is the, the Bai ethnicity. Um, and then along with that, too, you know, a lot of my surprise, I think more than culture shock with China, was how enormous its border is. There's more countries bordering than a country in the world. And even in the late 90s, going down on the Myanmar border, seeing how porous it was. You know, people coming and going, traders coming and going. This, these guys were the first people to tell me the word, the Chinese dream, back before Xi Jinping was ever a flicker in my eye. Um, you know, I think America, Obama wanted 150,000 refugees to be admitted to America every year. 160, does everybody know? Trump just ruffled feathers by saying 50 tops. China right now officially has 583 refugees being processed. This book. It has more billionaires on the Forbes rich list. Um, very different relationship to its border um, than we have here in the States, and I'll come back to that with North Korea in a second. I'm curious if any of you think about Tibet, 
read about Tibet, have been to Tibet lately? lately. When have you gone? About four years ago. And what was it like four years ago? Could you use your phone? Was it? Yeah, no, okay. everything worked pretty well. Uh, Lhasa was very different than the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. now, Lhasa was basically militarized, uh, with the exception of the Talon Palace. Uh, but when you went out into the smaller towns in the country, it was as if China didn't exist. That's interesting. I, did you notice, too, how many Sichuan people were in Lhasa? There's like sex tourism has become yes. a thing in Lhasa. Yeah. And sort of, so there's this, I ask because there's this push-pull, too, about our perceptions of China and what we're focusing on with China. You know, journalists aren't given access to Tibet anymore. You have to go in surreptitiously. In the late 90s, it was rather open, you know, that a, um, you would see even things like the Dalai Lama and Pan, these postcards that they sell at temples, you know, you could buy this in Lhasa. Or the Dalai Lama's birthday where they throw flour in the air and dust everybody was um, allowed to be celebrated. It wasn't tacit, it was tacitly allowed, I should say. Um, but the last time I was there, too, was about six years ago. And this is what it looked like in front of the Patel Palace now with the Tiananmen Square, mock, um, mock Square, and the national flag and the soldiers, and the road being called Beijing Road, you know, in front of it. Um, that's changed a lot, too. I'm just going to show you about 15 more slides, and then we can just have a discussion and talk. But after Peace Corps, I didn't know what to do. I had no prospects. And I find this a lot with places, you know, other Peace Corps volunteers in Guatemala or Mongolia just go home. And maybe they get to use their language at a Mongolian barbecue one day down the road and impress people. <laughs> but with China, you know, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Once you start understanding the country, exploring the country, learning the language better and better. You know, I learned language immersed in that little community in Neijiang. And I would write the words in Sharpie on my arm in Pinyin. And I would look like Spider-Man when I would go to restaurants. They'd say, Mian Tiao, you know, I'd be flicking my arm out to read what I wanted, right? I hope that didn't mean something. <laughs> Except flicking my arm at somebody. But it was really a shock. Like, after Peace Corps, I thought, I can't go back to the States. I have no prospects in the States. Um, I have this, this language ability. I have some knowledge now. I'm going to go to Beijing and, and work as a teacher. But again, I thought I was pretty fluent in Chinese until I got to Beijing and I opened my mouth. And then everybody did the, what are you talking <laughs> face? And it would be like maybe a Chinese person learning English in rural Arkansas, right? Because <laughs> if you know what Sichuanhua sounds like, you know, in, in, in Mandarin, it's, it's duo xiao qian, but it, in Sichuanhua, it's hao qian. And in, in, you know, it's not bu zhi dao, it's bu xiao de. And it's not mei guo, it's mei gui. And everything's that sort of lilting. And it's very, very sharp and direct. You know, in Mandarin, it's ni shuo shen ma. But instead of what, Sazamania, you know, said, ah, ah, ah. and people were just non plot And I realized, oh my god, I have to learn a new language now, essentially, which is Mandarin. And now I have a very exaggerated Beijing accent. So I was mimicking people in Beijing as well. I eventually got a Blakemore Foundation fellowship to go to Tsinghua and learn how to read, which helped a lot. But a lot of my Tsinghua studies, I was in a little room by myself, like an interrogation cell, and the teacher would say, Ma, Ma. Ma, and I had to hold up my fingers to what tone she was saying. You know, I'd have to start off. It was very humiliating. It's still a work in progress for me. Um, I got there in the late 90s. Beijing had traffic in the late 90s. You know, we hear these stories. This was always, the stories just come around again and again. And this was interesting. This was uh, an official at Heidi Ant told me, um, you know, we add the GDP by knocking things down just as much as we add the GDP by building them. So you're writing stories, you're interested immediately, like all this construction going on. They just built this road last year, now they're tearing it up again. He's like, we're putting people to work. Cement, again, I should have bought cement. Um, it's a cycle going through. I was a dork when I got there. You know, I was very much, the Sichuan people say, Shambhalao, uh, you know, Sakharen. Um, I was a countrysider. I did stupid things like this, like put on my rollerblades and, and skate around Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square is terrible for skating because there's big divots between the stones. Now there's a sign at Tiananmen Square, no skating, unfortunately. Um, but you know, again, I was, it was funny. People in Beijing looked at me like I was the yokel. But to me, Beijing was the outlier. Sichuan was quote unquote real China. And Beijing, they didn't take a shoshi, you know, and, and, and so forth. Um, it felt very different. Now, the big enormous difference for me, though, especially as a writer, was that Beijing had history. If you spent time in the Chinese countryside, there aren't museums to countryside life. You know, in the Manchuria book, I would go to little villages and ask, can I see your gazetteers? Can I see your census records, your tax records? 
And more often not, than not, they'd say, we burned them for fuel. We didn't keep them. You know, that history in the countryside is oral. Whereas when you're in Beijing, it's all around you, or at least a vestige of it is there. And this sort of became my guiding principle. If you've been to Tiantan, Temple of Heaven, you know, this echo wall. It's a circular brick wall where you whisper, and it travels all the way around the wall. And I really glommed onto that as a metaphor because immediately when I got to Beijing in the late 90s, this neighborhood where I was living you know, became this. We were seeing this massive change all the time. And I called the first book, The Last Days of Old Beijing, because it's a trope. Every hundred years, there's a last days of old Beijing, right? Old Beijing is torn down, new Beijing comes around again. This is uh, the, my neighborhood I was living in. I was teaching at an international school that used Chinese and English <laughs> linguistically and culturally. So I team taught with a Chinese teacher. I would teach the students in social studies about Rome. Rome was a great empire with feats of engineering. And then in Chinese, she would explain, Rome was built on the backs of slaves. You know, they would get these, these bifurcated um, perspective on everything, which was great. And these students have all gone on to, again, live wonderful lives at top universities and go into the State Department and so forth. But, I would start, I just started to realize I could use Beijing as my classroom, rather than sit in and read about history, we could go out and experience this. And in our neighborhood, um, there was an archaeologist with a yellow mesh hat, and he was with his little shovel all by himself. And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, it's a tomb from the Han Dynasty we dug up. And I thought, okay, it's 200 AD. You know, and he said, oh, you know, in America, you, you, we, could, we could sink our shovel around here and find something older than America. And I said, yeah, but in America, we stop construction and try to preserve it. And so we just have too much history. You know? And that was, again, as a writer, you go, okay, this is an interesting topic to start pursuing when you really think you have too much history. Because, in fact, as you know, all museums tell stories, but Chinese museums tell political <coughs> stories. And those stories inexorably end with liberation. But outside of those official museums, there are these individual personal artifacts and monuments to history. This was a, a restaurant in Beijing that was a communist, oh, I'm sorry, a cultural revolution themed restaurant where I could take my students and they could read you know, the newspapers from the time and eat dishes from the time. And I found this throughout China actually. You know, in the Manchuria book, I talk about people who say, oh, well, Chinese hate Japanese. In the Northeast, it's a bit more nuanced relationship because of the farmers that were sent to settle in the Northeast. And I met a young uh, historian in a little village on the banks of the Songhua River where he was trying to erect a plaque in memory of Japanese mothers who were waiting for rescue when the Soviet Union or the Russians were coming over the border to liberate Manchukuo. They put their children on the docks and the women stepped into the river and perished. And he said the, the children were adopted by local villagers and were raised there and so forth. And he said, we're trying to get a monument erected here in their memory because Japanese were victims of this war too. And it seems like every two years I get an email from him where it's like, I got close to getting it approved, and now it's not approved. And there's a cemetery in that, in that town that Joe and Lai himself consecrated to the memory of, of Japanese women um, that's now locked. You can't go in. But you know, these things, as you know, they, there's wind and waves here where things come back and cycle around. But I don't buy the fact that you know, like Chinese don't care about their history or Chinese don't want to you know, know about their past. Um, I think that they very much do. I started taking my students to places like Confucius's tomb, which was not a hot destination back in the day. There was really nothing going on there. Now Confucius quotes lie in elementary schools throughout the country. Where's that? That's in Shandong, uh, Chufu. His birthplace. Yeah. And I took them to the North Korean border. You know, and this is the bridge. Maybe some of you have been here in Dandong. Um, we're looking into North Korea. There's a Ferris wheel that I've never seen turn. Uh, this is one of my high school students there. And. It, when you go to the border, you realize all of a sudden that border is 800 miles long. That's the distance from San Diego to El Paso. And I've lived several years in the Northeast, and I've never heard a Northeastern person say to me, we're really worried about nuclear annihilation. What they're worried of is this great humanitarian disaster that's going to befall the region if North Koreans start coming over the river. Because the Yalu there is quite wide, but in many parts of that border, there are sand dunes, sandbars. There's Christian groups that have um, missions that throw aid packages over. The only time I've really been in trouble in China as a writer was I was detained near the border, um, and they thought I was a missionary, and I had to sit in this little police station and disprove my faith. And the way I did that was I said, get on Baidu.com, Google, you know, find me, uh, my, my books, 
And then the cops were so relieved. They said, oh, you're just a writer. It's the only time I've ever heard that. So I know. You can go. But you know, this is another uh, illustration of the history. There's a little plaque here that says the bridge was bombed by Americans in 1950. But as you see, the bridge was halfway bombed. And the story behind the bombing of this bridge is fascinating because, you know, Truman did not want MacArthur to go into Chinese airspace. And so for three days, Navy pilots bombed half the bridge. They put their landing gear down to slow down as they approached. And then I found a Chinese soldier who was 16 at the time who said, we watched the battle, we watched them drop half the bridge, it was really impressive. And then the river froze and 130,000 of us just walked across the next week and changed the war in our favor. Um, just a couple more pictures and I'll wrap up here. You know, it was also, I guess, these 20 years, if I could sum up the big change, it's been this transition to a market economy. Even in, in Xinjiang, you'd start seeing signs like this, you know, work hard today or tomorrow, you'll be looking hard for work. Um, and in the Northeast, you see this. And again, I, I mentioned earlier about capturing the exotic. Um, I was very wary about reporting on this. These are people praying in front of the statue of Mao in Shenyang, leaving bouquets of flower, their, uh, flowers. They're genuflecting, asking for work, because they've been laid off from state-owned enterprises. In my time in Shenyang, and I've been there several times over the last five years, this happens throughout the day. People come up, leave flowers, bow to Mao, ask for work, and so forth. Um, and then just to bring this full circle back to Wolong, what I was talking about earlier, the other big change was that you know, the central government cut off regions from uh, revenues, a large share of revenues, and said, you have to provide your own money for social services. And so what happened is this development of a tourism industry. And this is in Harbin. I know it was a stop on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. This, these buildings were formerly shameful, or they're, they've been rebranded as patriotic education bases. But in the Northeast, how else are you going to get tourists to come there? So a lot of these regions actually led the rest of the country in preserving their colonial architecture. And when I first went to St. Sophia's Orthodox Cathedral in the late 90s, you couldn't see the cathedral from the street because it was all um, block housing, you know, apartments around it. And when you got in through the housing, this was all boarded up. You can still see the yellow paint from the Cultural Revolution on it. It was being used as a department store warehouse. But all of a sudden, in 99, they started, the whole book and started attracting tourists to this now instead. And to my surprise, you know, this extends to Japanese architecture as well. This is in Changchun. It's a Shinto uh, shrine. Changchun was the capital of Manchukuo, the puppet state from 41 to 45. And I asked the Changchun official, like, why do you keep this here? And he shrugged and said, oh, people like to roller skate in front of it. Which maybe is true, but I, there's something deeper going on here um, by preserving these sort of things. And not preserving these more far-flung sites. This is the very end of the Great Wall out in Jiayiguan. I probably shouldn't be sitting on it like that. But um, at the time, you know, this wasn't a place where you bought tickets to go into. No one greeted you to sell you socks or water. Um, you could just walk up to the heritage itself and, and sit on it. Just as you could go to Fu Guangzi, this is outside of Wu Taishan in Shanxi, um, the oldest wood building that Liang Sichang had, had written about. It's back from the Tang Dynasty. And when you're out in these mountainous areas, as I'm sure some of you have experienced, you still see vernacular culture. You still see regional opera, you know, touring companies of Shanxi opera players and so forth. And that's been another big shift all of a sudden now is. Let's not just preserve old buildings, because of the architecture, it's very difficult to preserve old buildings and so forth. Let's start um, preserving intangible cultural heritage. And there's a Chinese writer in Tianjin who I write about in this book called Feng Jitai, who said, you know, he always knows he's in trouble when he wants to log. He feels like he's part of the Song Dynasty, like the Mongols are coming. I better hurry up and catalog everything I can, recipes, folk songs, and so forth. And so when he goes to these villages and he sees satellite dishes on the rooftops, he knows he's in trouble. Or when migrants come back from the coast and they say, well, this culture is silly. We should watch The Voice you know, on television, which is a very popular show uh, right now. Not all culture is worth preserving, I think I would argue. In Kashgar, you know, the preservation of intangible cultural heritage has extended to cockfighting. Only now the government has appointed a referee. He has to monitor all of the cockfights, and the roosters have bands on their uh, talons. They can't cut one another instead. It's a way for men to gamble uh, more than anything else. And then that comes back to Beijing, which I guess is a good place to end. But I do want to conclude by talking a little bit about what happened at Wulong. So I was involved in, in pitching to the local officials how you should preserve the, the valley. And you, we had um, Frank Lloyd Wright's um, old, 
I guess he's the only living disciple of Frank Lloyd Wright, someone who worked at Taliesin, was there on site with us, and he was designing a panda center. It was going to flow with the region and so forth, the, um, the natural splendor. And we had all these presentations, and there was other big firms who had built the Beijing airport there, and they were presenting. And at the end, I finally said to our team, like, well, we have to bribe them, don't we? Because you're giving a presentation to guys in windbreakers with comb-overs, essentially. They all sort of look the same. They're not betraying any emotion. I said, we're going to have to bribe them, aren't we? And the, the head of our, the Chinese side of our, our group said, you know, we don't have any money. We can't bribe them. It's not going to happen. Um, and a lot of lobbying went back and forth. There's a lot of hurry up and start, hurry up and start, stop. And then all those officials got sacked, and they all got jailed for corruption. Because the hotel we had met in, they had squandered funds to build, um, and it wasn't supposed to have built in the first place, and so forth. So we had to go back two years later and start this enormous process again. And then the massive earthquake hit right before the Olympics. And that area of Wolong that I showed you in the beginning is completely abandoned now. It, we mudslides took it out. They've moved the Panda Research Center to a different part of the valley. And so I don't know if that's, you know, I said I'm an optimist, but in a lot, in a lot of ways, too, I feel like maybe my 20 years in China has come for naught. Um, I don't know. It depends on maybe your reaction to this talk and the questions you have after this. But I'll end there. Thank you. Well, I would certainly say your 20 years in China had not come to naught. <laughs> Uh, and all of your, I'm sure, hundreds of thousands of readers will mm. firmly dispute that as well. Um, I know you all probably have a lot of questions, so I'm going to just open it right up and let people start asking questions. Bill. Yeah, I'm Bill Iampresta, retired journalist. I love to invent your, your talk and I'm eager to read this one. I just wanted to ask you, uh, do many provinces and cities have uh, uh, historic preservation commissions? Or? They do, and it's, you know, but it's a good point you bring this up about regional. So, like, the Patala Palace manager, for example, said, I know the Met, I mean, they're very worldly now, people who are appointed to these positions, right? And they say, well, we know the Met has different pricing structures. We know the Met has late opening hours, you know, where they can... Um, control the flow of visitors and so forth. We can't do any of that because it's all national level. It's all nationally decreed what the opening hours are going to be, what the ticket price is going to be. And so even though in the provinces and cities they might have their own Wenhuaji, right, a cultural bureau of some sort, actually gazetting something and protecting it is very difficult to do. Um, oftentimes the local level, including Beijing, my old neighborhood, these parcels have been auctioned off, or these sites have been sold to developers by the district government or the regional, you know, the, the lowest level governments 20 years ago, and are now just waiting to be developed. And so it's difficult for people interested in preserving things to even get through the, the stack of, of uh, transactions that have already occurred. Yeah. So Wolong is a good case in point for that. It's a national treasure. It's the Panda Research Base. The national government did not pay for the reconstruction of the Panda Center. Hong Kong did. Hong Kong said, well, you haven't used X amount of dollars from our, our relief fund that we collected for the earthquake. Why don't you, you know, steer it toward that? And as a result now, if you have a Hong Kong resident card or passport, you never have to pay admission to go to the Wolong Panda Preserve. But again, the question is, why wouldn't Beijing step in to fund that? You know what? Why, why, why? I don't know. <laughs> Somebody here might know. But let me yeah. follow through on that. Um, and it sort of stems, my response stems from one of the earliest things you said. Yeah. You first went to China, and to you, that handmade bamboo chair yeah. was unusual, different, exotic. To the local people, it was shameful because it was old and ugly. Right. And when I started going to China before you were born, um, there was that kind of feeling. Um, that you're embarrassed by all of this, whereas we in the West see it not just as exotic, but important to preserve. Mm -hmm. So where is China along that spectrum of realizing that it's not shameful, that it is worthwhile saving? And do you see a difference generationally? So you, you mm -hmm. also talked about in Meijang. Yeah, Meijang. Meijang. Now paying attention to environmental issues and livable city, yeah. etc. 
and I know that the younger generation, both in this country and in China, are more concerned about preserving the environment. Mm -hmm. Are they also concerned more about preserving old things? No, I'd say no. And I was, as you were asking that question, I was thinking everybody I've met who's interested in preserving old things seems to be 60 or older. Someone who's lived through the culture evolution and the destruction of the, you know, and maybe even can remember what Beijing looked like or what Chengdu once looked like. You know, if you go to Chengdu now and you look at it, I think, oh, it probably always looked like this. Well, no, it didn't. The mosque used to be next to German Mao and, and so forth. So, but I do see the younger generation much more interested in the environment, definitely. But maybe not so much as old things. This leads to another thing. I'm surprised there's an audience for these books in China. You know, I was just at a nonfiction writers conference in Taiwan. They did a Chinese writers nonfiction conference, and it's me and two middle-aged Chinese writers. And the question was, first of all, where are the books about Taiwan? That was a big question, of course. Um, that's my next down the road project. Um, but the question is, why aren't Chinese writers documenting this? Why aren't they as interested in our culture and the changes in our cities as foreigners seem to be? And part of that is the same reason Chinese cities look the way they do. There's market reasons for it. It's very difficult if you're a single child, born after 77, let's say, who has to take care of mom and dad, has to have a house, has to keep a job. You can't just quit your job and go out for three years in the countryside and immerse yourself somewhere and then hope, maybe I'll get a book advance, and then deal with the censorship that might result from it, and then deal with chasing down your royalties and everything else. There's no MFA programs in China. Um, I have students now I recruit to come over to Pitt to our MFA program for that reason. Um, there's very few journalism schools in China. You know, Tsinghua, Beida, Zhongshan, it's kind of it. I think maybe Fudan has one. So there isn't that same mechan market mechanism that we have in the States here to support nonfiction writing. You think of all the charitable foundations we can throw a rock at right now that supports writers around here. Um, that doesn't exist in China. Yeah. So, Jan, back to your point. I think the environmental thing, though, it used to be, you know, what was it, Fajan, Taishu, Yin, Dali. It was, everything was off development. And now it seems to be more about livable cities. And so you used to get promoted through the ranks of the party by showing the investment you've raised, the revenues you've raised. And now you can, your portfolio can shift based on the greening of your city or the air pollution is getting better. This is what's amazing to me. I don't know if you feel the same way. I'm amazed the party is still in power. It definitely shifts and reads percep you know, public perception in a very amazing way to me. I never, it's beyond my capabilities, but I thought, having lived in Beijing in the late 90s especially, the slow way to Beijing spring, that, oh, this is all going to change. Yeah. Well, the environmental aspect, if you understand, because it's right there, it's in your face, or, mm. or you, know, you can't see it beyond it, so I understand the younger people, you know, you just got to, they understand we have to change to survive. Yeah. Preserving an old building does not have an effect on whether you survive or not. But it's just, I, I, I like your reasoning pointing to the fact that they're single children and they have to make a living and support their parents and that and so resonates. It, but Ling, you're saying, no? What, why do you think? Chinese are not interested in historical Well, which is going to generalize all China. I think some China. I, mean, I, well, I, I, I yeah. do think that the uh, you know volunteerism is on the rise, and there's a lot That's more true. Young, uh, younger uh, members of younger generation who are interested in going to the countryside. And the, you see more even going to Southeast Asia, spending a year. The more than that. Right, but I mean particularly about historic preservation. Yeah, yeah. but they're what they are interested in is commercialization. Yeah. Which is, you know, yeah. doing great now. I'm amazed. Uh, like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, well, because Goldman Sachs isn't going to put money into a real estate fund right now to build more malls in Beijing. But, you know, where I lived in Beijing was this area right here outside of Tiananmen Square. And that, you know, most of the hutong in Beijing, they started from the, the outer, you know, going in, tearing it down, still exists. And they will. The people will say, officials will say, look at Covent Garden. We're doing that here. It's a commercialization of an old neighborhood, not residential. Yeah. So there, I mean, there is a, a level of interest. I mean, yeah. Most of the people that are there are from out of, you know, they're Chinese, but not from Beijing. And that, it has now become a tourist destination. Yeah. And it's a commercial, you know, an, an old Hutong commercial house. Yeah. Bill, can you, can you just tell us who you are and why you know what you're saying? <laughs> Sorry, I'm Bill Rossoff. And, I actually live in Beijing, uh, in a hotel. Uh, Where on the map? Further north, I'm in Dongcheng. Okay. Um, and so I've lived through sort of the more recent 
I don't know whether you call it beautification or destruction. Uh, you know, they have been. One, one nice thing is they realized some time ago that the central part of that Jim Dong Chang and Shishan um, is worth preserving. And so yeah. I think those two tones are now safe. And where I live, I think they're going to be safe. Yeah. Um, from the high rise and uh, the high rises. On the other hand, what they have done is they have systematically gone through this really in the last couple of years and bricked up all of the things that made those hutons so lively, nice local bars and restaurants, and it now just torn them down um, and bricked them up. And in a sense, you could call that preservation. You turn the hutons to what they were, kind of, I don't know, post, post revolution, I guess. Is that more gentrification? It's a demigratization. It's a de <laughs> what it is, it's a demigratization, yeah. leading yeah. to gentrification. Um, but with no sense of preservation of the community at all. Um, and they just do it kind of in an unthinking kind of way. You know, it's, it's, I say the demigratization, if that's a word, because um, when my Beijing book is taught in, at university in China, invariably it's taught not as a book about the need to protect old heritage. It's a polemic against um, the lack of affordable housing in inner cities. Because the Hutong did become a place for migrants to come in, put their, and I would argue to officials again, you're creating Beijingers with this neighborhood because they come in, they start speaking Beijing Hua, their kid goes to the local school, they start paying taxes for the first time, they become the status, they support the status quo, and now you're taking that out of it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's exactly yeah. And in a way, though, you're right. It's going back to what it was in the 19 teens and 20s, a pleasure zone for the rich. I mean, that's what these lanes were at one point. Yeah. Lin, yeah. uh, it's the Henry Louis Foundation. Um, you, you said you're an optimist. And, uh, <laughs> I think in a way uh, for uh, journalists and writers who uh, went to China in the 1980s and 90s, it, it, it was uh, somewhat easier you know, to be optimistic about China and, or even you know, fell in love with China, yeah. even though the actual conditions were um, you know, a lot worse. You know, in, some uh, major aspects, uh, if you think about some of what happened in the 80s, 90s. But now, uh, in recent years, and there's an increasing kind of exodus of uh, yeah. people who felt like they once they loved China so much, but they felt they had had enough, and it's becoming a lot harder right, to, to, to love China. And I work with a lot of um, aspiring uh, you know, um, journalists and writers and young people. Who are now, you know, who did not couldn't have the experience you have, and they they are now going to China. And what kind of advice? You know, <laughs> Read this book. <laughs> uh, that, that you you would give it to, to them that they yeah. had no uh, possibility of experiencing, or to actually go into the kind of uh, environment you were in to immerse themselves in. So you know. So <coughs> you you raised two really good points. The first thing I tell everybody is don't wait for permission to write. Don't pitch New York-based editors. You know, after this, I'm going to the New York Times, and it's always a, a, a lesson. I like going to the Wall Street Journal better because they're very interested in China in a different way. Um, but it, it's you can when you go to China, you can often feel like, well, all these experts know this stuff already. I have nothing to contribute to this. I would love to read a book set in Gansu, in Inner Mongolia, in Tibet. You know, in what a fisherman's life is in Dalian. All those things are there are, have not been written. Um, so I tell people, go have your own experience and then like, take notes as if you're a Song Dynasty scribe trying to capture it before it disappears. The other thing I'm really glad you bring up, Li Ling, is that my wife is a big part of this narrative, and it seems weird to speak to a room full of strangers about my 20 relationship with my wife, but she's a big part of this narrative because she's not an optimist, right? She's a, a Berkeley trained lawyer who, when Chinese, she, Berkeley. Chinese Berkeley trained lawyer who when she goes, you know, when she came with me to her home village in Manchuria, and I was writing the book in Manchuria, this rice farm, she was back for about 10 days. She quit her job in Manhattan, came with me, lasted about 10 days before she said, I'm out of here. She said, I'm the baby of the village again. I'm a Chinese girl. No one wants to talk to me as an intellectual, as a professional. Um, and so she moved to Hong Kong and started working as a lawyer there, right? And then we were living in Singapore after that. But in the book later on, you know, she sits in, in, in a courtroom in Dongcheng, because you could go in. With, with the Olympics, they said, oh, we have so much transparency here. Come on in, and you can sit through court sessions. 
Um, and she's threatened with arrest because they seize her notes. There's a sign on the wall that says you can't take notes, right? Well, I go in as the law lie. Hey, don't take notes. Ha, 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 ha. And for her, it's very different. For Chinese researchers especially, it's very, very different. And so I do sound that note throughout the book, too. You know, toward the end of the book, Ai Weiwei, I'm going out to see Ai Weiwei um, on June 4th, actually. He's like, come on June 4th. That's a good day to come meet me at my house. <laughs> I don't know about that, Mr. Ai. Um, but he actually said, I said, you know, there's playing there's cops all over the place in front of your house. And he's like, you know, very vulgar, as you can imagine. You know, who the F do you think you are? You're an American writer. You should not be afraid. You should not be cowed. If you're censoring yourself, then they've really won, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like... Again, easy for you to say, Mr. I. I'm the, this is before he was detained and beaten. Um, but I did go, and I felt, you know, I felt really ashamed actually walking through the police court, and, and nobody asking me for my passport. They don't care, right? I'm a foreigner. Um, and so again, that, that's a good divide. Uh, foreigners can always leave. Always. I've been detained. It's uncomfortable. It's scary. But ultimately, it's fine. You know, you get assigned a fine, you go, you always make the cops angry, you tell them to go to the post office and do a mail order for the fine, so I'm going to receive, you know, you play those games. But it's not that way for Chinese. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about maybe why there isn't as much Chinese nonfiction. Is it's quite dangerous still to do this work yeah. if you're Chinese. Yeah. 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 I'm curious about you uh, talking about the difference between the New York Times <laughs> and the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> the journal is um, one person makes a decision, the New York Times is its committee. So it's difficult always to deal with a committee, whereas the journal is one person saying yes or no. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and also, the Times people have a lot of experience in China, so they have their own. You know, some of them were former correspondents in China who are now up in the mass type stuff. So. Yeah. Hi, Bob Peters Hi. of uh, Sidley Austin and the National Committee. Um, what is your read of the current attitude of the, of, of the Chinese populace toward its more recent history, mainly the revolution? And because I, I remember when I started going about the same time you did, you get in a cab and there'd be a medallion with mouse picture yeah. on it hanging off the middle. You never see that anymore. And then 10 years later, I go to Harbin and there's a comedy club with a revolutionary theme where people run around singing revolutionary songs to mass hysteria by the eating, by the eating group there. What, what's your attitude, what do you think China's attitude is now toward the recent or the revolutionary past? That's a good, my wife was working for your firm in Singapore. That's the case, Matt, we were just talking about that. Li Ling, do you want to answer that for me? What the, I, I mean, I really, to be honest with you, I, I write in here in this book, and it, it, sometimes it gets me in trouble at places like the Wall Street Journal where it's said, in China, politics is like the weather. You don't really comment on it that much unless something bad's happening. A tornado's coming towards you or it's pouring, you have an umbrella. Um, when you're living your daily life, it just, in my experience, and I volunteered in elementary schools, and I was teaching at university, and I was living on a farm, it just didn't come up that much unless you had a lawsuit, you were pressing, you know, petitioning, or unless, I'm even thinking of textbooks, what my elementary kids were reading, and the high school students stuff, it just doesn't come up that much. And maybe I'm blind, I'm curious if that was your experience as well, or anybody else who's worked in China recently? That's my experience. Yeah. Oh, I, I will tell you that I, I teach at Chinua Law School, and just in the last year, I'm starting to hear you know, everyone's very quiet and cautious, but um, for the first time I actually had some students quietly say they were upset because, I don't know, you probably all know about the inspections that the government's been doing while the university is in the last year. And Tsinghua always thought itself a little above all the past, <laughs> no more. And they were quite upset because one of the results of the inspection was that course that was taught it wasn't called that, but it was basically a course on the Cultural Revolution. Oh, interesting. Uh, it's now gone. Oh. And the students are kind of noticing that, and I'm thinking mm -hmm. kind of all of a sudden the China dream, as she called it, is trying to raise more questions than it, it used to. And then, you know, it may also be because it's harder for them to figure out what they got to realize, and these are the top students in China, and it sort of so what do I do next? So it probably all goes together, but I think there's been a 
I, I'm more concerned with uh, uh, about these uh, inspection teams and uh, also the directives coming directly from the central government, and they can have real chilling uh, effects and, uh, and damage, uh, effects, more so than the expression of popular nostalgia. And, and that's always existing. There's always a kind of maybe not so fringe anymore, but you know the people who um, are leftist or who you know who yearn for the bygone era of what happened to the kind of uh, egalitarian um, society existing <coughs> supposedly you know, in, uh, during the contribution before. But, but I think uh, you know, when we, we make plans to work with uh, institutions in, uh, in China, right, we've noticed that there's a real um, change of tones and uh, how willing uh, the, you know, the universities and the institutions working with uh, you know, international Collaborating with international groups, and, and they, they, their concerns are very real. And uh, oftentimes, there are unofficial, unofficial uh, directives, and uh, you know that people are, um, you know, from higher up, and telling, um, um, telling the, you know, our collaborators, you know, certain things, and then and specifically saying that you are not allowed to tell the foreigners uh, what we tell you, and uh, otherwise it's. Uh, state secret or whatever, right? but nevertheless, you know these things leaked, and so there's a lot of uh, unofficial um, kind of a silencing, clamping down, and it's, it's, it's pretty bad. Done. Um, Give us a little. Tell you us you yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, um, um, your connection uh, to China. Retired Foreign Service officer who's uh, served in Beijing and Chengdu over the years. Uh, my question is a little different, which is. Do you have anything more to say about Peace Corps literature coming out of China? <laughs> yeah. I, as preface to this, yeah. uh, there were in, in India in the 60s and 70s there were thousands of Peace Corps volunteers. We all had fascinating experiences. There's not one work of literary merit yeah. out of those thousands of volunteers. I, I guarantee I've looked into it. Whereas in China, with relatively few volunteers, I can think of at least three authors of great merit. I mean. Rivertown, your work, yeah. uh, Kosher Chinese, like uh, Levy, yeah. uh, from Weizhou, fascinating. So my question is, are there any other more recent authors that we should be looking at, and what caused this outburst of literary merit, if you will? That's a good question. You know, I went back and spoke this swearing in, um, and speaking of that, Li Ling, when I went back to do the swearing in for the volunteers two years ago, I was asked to show my remarks ahead of time, and that was a big change. Usually you just stand up and hi, everybody, you know, with a little bit of um, now there are 120 volunteers, I think, or is even more, 140 volunteers. They've, um, they look a lot more like America now. They have married gay couples. There's many more African Americans, Chinese Americans. It's not just a bunch of Midwestern white guys like it was when I was there. The literature, you know, Rob Schmitz was um, in our group. He's the NPR correspondent now. And Pete, who's now writing about Egypt, and myself, and Mike Levy a few years later. And then, not so much after that. And I don't know if that's, again, with marketing. Publishers finally started saying, OK, enough's enough. Um, but you know, as many of you don't know, Peace Corps doesn't officially want anybody writing. You're officially supposed to not be writing. Um, and so Pete broke a lot of rules. He broke that taboo by doing Rivertown. And it was, initially, Peace Corps wasn't very happy about that. But since come around. Um, so I, I don't have a real good answer for that. I don't know. I find more and more volunteers now. Now you can choose what country you want to go to in Peace Corps. So the China volunteers I met are very specific. A lot of them already speak Chinese, have masters in Chinese art, or they're going there for certain reasons. And maybe to write about a place like the Tocqueville writing about America, you have to be completely, it has to be new to you in some way. I don't know. Yeah. But that is a good point. There aren't a lot of good Peace Corps books from other countries. And China has quite a few, which is rare. Yeah. In the in and even I was just in the interview. Jake Hooker won the last New York Times Pulitzer from China for fake pharmaceuticals, um, and then he had enough and quit and went to Iowa to study fiction. You know, so it's like maybe that's another reason. I don't know. People just get sick of trying to tell their stories. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Ramy Inocencio of uh, Bloomberg News here is a Peace Corps. Oh, I didn't know that. Here. Uh, Sichuan, I think, around 12 years ago, okay. but I don't think he's written any books. And they're all men. And this is the thing my wife always kicks me under the table to remind people. Like it was a lot easier to be a man in Peace Corps in China at that time, and I think still today it is. Um, and there's been a discussion within Peace Corps. 
where are these female volunteers? Why are they leaving? Why don't they stay on in China and work? And why isn't anybody writing? You know, why aren't they writing or working in journalism? Jessica. Um, Jessica, I work here at the National Committee. I'm a senior program officer. I kind of have an, an, an annoying question that might be impossible to answer, but in about two weeks, I'm taking a group of 11 congressional staffers to China for 10 days. 10 out of the 11 have never been. The one who's been was there for three days, I think, in 1996. Um, how, do you have any advice as to how I can help them frame what they're seeing? I mean, we're going to Beijing, and then we're going to Kunming, and a little bit outside of Kunming. And, um, your quote about, you know, you've had the experience, but did you get the meaning? Yeah. That really resonates with me and like all the work that we do, especially bringing groups to China. And um, we give them a ton of background materials. We travel with a PIP fellow um, to help contextualize things that they're seeing. But I know it's so much for them to digest when they're there. And, you know, we do what we can to really help them get the meaning. But and do you have any like overarching thoughts or questions that might be able to help them frame what? see that short period of time. So when I left Madison, Wisconsin, I wanted to learn something about China when I was going to Peace Corps, and an uh, elderly librarian took me into the library, uh, and she showed me that stack, you know, that, that shelf of red spines. You always know the China section. You see the red from across the room. And, um, you know, some of these titles were things like With the Chinks, and there's horrible 1920s titles. And she pulled Pearl Buck out, and she said, this is a, a, a book of speeches that Pearl Buck gave to American GIs going to be stationed in Kunming. And her speeches, you know, Provok is very elegant and lovely in the way she speaks and the way she carries herself. And she, but she says something that resonated with me so much. I remember writing it down and taping it up on my mirror in, in when I got to Nijang. And it was, don't compare. Don't compare. Because if the purpose to travel all the way around the world is only to say things are not as they are at home, then you've wasted the trip, right? And so try to see things as they are and try to take them in at their own level. And I know that, yeah. Maybe that's easier said than done, but that helped me to get away from, oh, famous dog cigarettes with a spaniel, that's funny, and instead maybe look beyond that to, where's this tobacco grown? Does the state own the tobacco factory? Why is it called famous dog? Is that a colonial era brand? And start going behind what you just see at surface value um, and dig a little bit deeper, if that helps. Yeah. I can send you that Pearl Buck link, actually. Okay, yeah. Like, yeah, it's a yeah, great speech. Since you're going to yeah, yeah, it's a great speech. She's lovely. Her writing is still really fun. And you know, in this book, Lin Yutong is throughout, it comes throughout this book, because back in the day, if you went to a Xinhua bookstore in Sichuan, you could buy all of Dickens and all of O. Henry and all of Shakespeare. And that's kind of it in English, except for Lin Yutong's My Country and My People. Um, and Li Yutang was a, a colleague of Pearl Box, and he wrote this book in 1935, Introducing China to American Audiences, right? And I quote that book, that book throughout this book. I find him still very useful to read. That's a way of telling you to buy these guys, my, these people my book. Um, but I still find that useful, because they're along that line again of, you know, he said that China is too big of a country to, to, um, <coughs> to not contradict yourself when you're talking about it. The countryside is beautiful but also harsh, you know? China is ancient, but also modern. I mean, so you'll go crazy if you think like that. Um, and the, 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 the challenge is to go beyond the marketplace, is what he kept saying. Try to engage culturally um, beyond just transactions in the market. And then just one follow-up. Yeah. Why are all the Peace Corps writers that we were just talking about, yeah. do you think that all of you are from the Midwest has anything to do with Yes, I do. For the same reason, I think Bob Dylan and F. Scott Fitzgerald and Sinclair Lewis, you know, there's a reason they came from the Midwest, too. I think the Midwest just engenders the most brilliant writers. It's all the corn we eat. I was born in Madison. Oh, there you go. It's all the corn. It's got to be. Well, we have unfortunately come to the witching hour, but it's interesting since you've, you've all raised this. The, the, extraordinary writers that have come out of the, the Peace Corps. And um, I, I was thinking, because this is a trilogy, yeah. and you say it's the last, uh, well, clearly, the, yes. third, the last of the trilogy. Um, so I do have one last question is, what's next? Mm. Um, but in terms of the trilogy, it just strikes me that in addition to your trilogy of books, you form the third leg of a trilogy of writers who really 
take us beyond and do ask those questions that you were saying one should ask, you know, starting with Peter Hessler and then our Kevin Osnos and yep. you. And it's really quite extraordinary what the three of you have done in terms of humanizing this country to people, not just who don't know it at all, but those of us in this room who thought we knew it so well, but you bring a lot of just really wonderful added nuances and insights and ways of making us think differently. So I want to thank you for that. So that's my praise, ending But thing. Jen, I have to but praise you. This book wouldn't have happened if I had not joined PIP. Yes. That's really true. <laughs> This tell my you, whole, tell I don't, to a funder right I don't there. want this. I, to, I don't want this way. to be framed as a Peace Corps book because it's really being with Pip, which is the whole um, mo of this group, right? Is to to translate China to lay people to the to a general audience. How do you take all this expertise and make people care? Um, and being in these sessions with a lot of very smart people and realizing, you know, it's time to write a book when the book you want to read doesn't exist, which is. How do you get somebody who's never been to China? How do you make him or her think, if this schmuck can do it, I can do it too? And that's what I set out to do here. Yeah. So that's really inspired by Jan, honestly. I'm not just saying that. Thanks to Ling, because we wouldn't have money <laughs> to do it if it weren't for him and his colleagues at Luce. But yeah. So tell us finally what's next. I'm writing a book about Benjamin Franklin right now, which is fascinating. He loved China. He was fascinated by China. He lived in London in the 1750s, and then after that, you know, he was very interested in the McCartney mission and, and things that were coming out of China, the inventions and so forth. He would put Confucius quotes on the front page of the Philadelphia newspaper. Um, so I'm doing a book about Franklin, and then after that, it's going to be Taiwan. We need a good Taiwan book. Publishers don't know this yes. yet. <laughs> Every publisher goes, oh God, no. But we really need a Taiwan book. Yeah, so that's it. Wonderful. All right. Well, we're we'll all welcome back yeah, here yeah, for the exactly. time on. Yeah. 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 Yeah.